Welcome back once again to Intuitive Epidemiology in the final segment of this three-part video series on the Table 2 fallacy. I will show you how to avoid the Table 2 fallacy, particularly in exploratory or hypothesis-generating epidemiological studies. This is me. As discussed at the beginning of part two, People often commit the table two fallacy while doing exploratory or hypothesis generating research. Therefore, in studies that report factors associated with or correlates of an outcome, such as the open safely study discussed in part two, you will see the following statements and conclusions. For example, sex might be associated with an outcome such as COVID-19 death, and often you see a recommendation that something should be done for, in this case, males to reduce the occurrence of the outcome and particular recommendations for physicians or policymakers are then given. The same sort of idea can be seen for associations between risk factors or exposures such as age, deprivation, diabetes, and asthma along with particular ethnicities, which are reported in the abstract of the Open Safely paper discussed at length in part two. With respect to exploratory or hypothesis generating studies, as introduced in part two, I believe there is a widespread misunderstanding in epidemiology. Specifically, if you are interested in drawing similar conclusions, in other words, your exposure is associated with the outcome, and that you should do something about the exposure in order to reduce the outcome, you are in fact interested in an underlying causal structure. And it's important to note that confounding bias does not disappear in this setting. And that it remains true that models that do not reflect a hypothesized reality or conceptual framework, which may be depicted using a diagram or a directed acyclic graph, are largely uninformative. In terms of the conclusion in the May 25th version of the Westerreich, Van Smeden, and Edwards comment on the Open Safely paper discussed at length in part two, it's important to look at each exposure on its own and potentially fit a series of multivariable models, or you can think of it as a series of table twos in order to more meaningfully examine the relationship between a given exposure or risk factor and an outcome under study. And at the bottom is the conclusion from part two, where interpreting multiple measures of effect from a single multivariable model is almost always a bad idea. You should be thinking about the hypothesized reality you are examining, drawing diagrams, and assigning specific roles, such as exposure, confounder, or effect modifier, to the variables in your model. In terms of a new version of this comment that was released a few days ago on July 31st, Westerreich, Van Smeden, and Edwards then talk about how it is unclear how a strictly exploratory study or non-causal risk factor analysis helps us make scientific progress. So they say often risk factor analyses like this are held up as hypothesis generating or exploratory but it is unclear in what way they are useful in forming hypotheses about subsequent hypothesis confirming questions. While I agree with this, I'm going to propose a strategy where hypothesis generating studies can still be completed while acknowledging the first conclusion and also taking to heart the fact that indeed, hypothesis generating studies can be made far more useful if the following strategies are applied. It's important to acknowledge that it is true that many papers, particularly those with the labels of exploratory or hypothesis generating, do indeed commit the table two fallacy. It is also true that many papers of this nature that commit the fallacy still often get published, especially in non-epidemiology journals, such as clinical journals or substantive area specific journals. It's also been shown that you can get published in the journal Nature while publicly committing the table two fallacy. However, as shown in part two, there is a lot of chatter about this floating around in the epidemiological methods world, which I've noticed on Twitter. 
Therefore, while some methods-focused epidemiologists, as shown on the last slide, would argue that exploratory models are innately flawed, I believe there are ways to do exploratory or hypothesis-generating studies while avoiding the tables two fallacy. Say you are interested in four potential covariates, so four risk factors, four correlates, or four potential exposures, and their relationship with a given outcome. So covariate one through four, the first could be some socioeconomic factor, the other could be a sociodemographic factor, third could be a behavioral factor, fourth could be a clinical factor. Essentially, anything under the sun. In other words, you are not interested in focusing your study on a single exposure of interest, but you wish to draw conclusions in your exploratory study about four different exposures. In my view, first, you should acknowledge that this sort of approach deviates from traditional epidemiological thinking. And this is what the entire focus of the first part of this video series was about. Second, ask yourself if you are doing this, if you are doing an exploratory or a hypothesis generating model, because you are afraid that if you focus on one exposure, you may not get a statistically significant finding. It's important to note that doing exploratory studies because you want to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall to see what sticks is not good science. Third, remember that if you want to draw meaningful conclusions about any covariate outcome relationships in your exploratory study, you should still consider the conclusions of the Table 2 fallacy paper, as well as the comment by Westreich, Van Smeden, and Edwards. So, what does this conclusion that I've highlighted at various parts of this video series mean? First, do not get bogged down by the word causal effect. In your mind, just replace the word causal with meaningful or useful. This comment on the Table 2 Fallacy Fraught paper, known as Open Safely, indicates that we should consider the confounding structure of our exposure outcome pairs. What that means essentially is to draw a diagram of the hypothesized reality between your risk factors or your exposures of interest and your outcome. They also suggest to pursue a separate data analysis for each covariate outcome relationship. And again, a covariate could be labeled as an exposure, a risk factor, a correlate, and so on. So what does this mean? It means not to do this. This is what is done in the Open Safely paper. They present a single multivariable model of all the different risk factors or exposures, and they go on to state the following. The association between covariate one and the outcome adjusted for covariates two, three, and four is adjusted odds ratio. Again, these could be adjusted risk ratios or adjusted hazard ratios in the case of the open safely study. They then cycle through and interpret covariate two. In this case, covariate two or the relationship between covariate two and the outcome, whatever that may be, is now adjusted for covariates one, three, and four. You will notice that I'm not saying adjusted for confounding because these variables are not labeled as confounders, but they are mutually adjusted for each other. We then talk about covariate three and its association with the outcome, which is now adjusted for covariates one, two, not three, and four. And lastly, covariate four and the outcome adjusted for covariates one, two, and three. So these are all adjusted measures of effect I've shown as adjusted odds ratios here. And this is the textbook definition of the table two fallacy. This is what we are trying to avoid, but unfortunately this is what is often done in exploratory or hypothesis generating studies, such as the Open Safely paper. I would hope that after watching the first two parts of this video series, that it would be intuitive to you to do the following instead. And this is indeed a visual representation of the recommendations from the Westreich Greenland Table 2 Fallacy paper, and it's also a visual representation of the conclusions from the comment by Westreich, Van Smeden, and Edwards. 
In other words, if you want to examine the relationship between various covariates, whether those be exposures, risk factors, whatever label you give them, fit a series of multivariable models, each of which are based on a hypothesized reality or diagram. So as you can see here, instead of having a table two, we have a table two dash one. So this is multivariable model one of four. And while it's not shown, this model is based on a diagram, such as a directed acyclic graph, where we have our covariate one of interest, the variable which you want to draw conclusions about. And this model is adjusted for confounders of the covariate one outcome relationship. I've used placeholder confounder one, two, and three here, but the idea is that you have a multivariable model. You may or may not show the adjusted measures of effect for the confounders, but indeed you would only interpret the adjusted odds ratio or potentially risk ratio or hazard ratio for the exposure of interest, which in this case is covariate one. This is how you avoid the table two fallacy and get a more interpretable answer for the effect of this variable on your outcome of interest. Similarly, you would look at covariate two in a separate multivariable model or table two dash two. Again, I've made up placeholder numbers for confounders, but in this case, you might adjust for confounder two, four, and five. Again, in this case, you now get a more meaningful answer for the covariate two outcome relationship Table 2.3, multivariable model 3, indeed looking at covariate 3. And lastly, table 2-4, multivariable model 4, based on the hypothesized reality or conceptual framework showing the potential link between the fourth covariate and the outcome under study. And again, using random placeholders, this model is adjusted for confounders 4, 7, and 8. So in terms of exploratory or hypothesis generating studies, how do you avoid interpreting multiple measures of effect from a single multivariable model, thus committing the table two fallacy while still doing your exploratory work? My suggestion based on my readings of references that I've given is to fit a multivariable model for each covariate. So four covariates or four exposures, you should have four models. As I've noted, the confounders I've included in these models are arbitrary, they are made up, but the takeaway is that the confounding variables will inevitably differ in each model because the variables that might contribute bias to all these different exposure outcome relationships will likely differ based on your understanding of the literature. Again, I haven't shown the diagrams, but each one of these different table twos, table two dash one, dash two, dash three, and dash four, are all being informed by hypothetical diagrams or hypothesized realities, and they will differ for each covariate under examination. Now, you may be thinking to yourself that you are worried this will be too many tables for a single scientific paper, and that the journal will not allow you to submit your exploratory or your hypothesis generating study because you now have a series of table twos as opposed to a single table two. However, there is no need to worry. Remember that the adjusted odds ratios for the confounding variables have little interpretability. Remember that the confounders unique to each multivariable model are serving a specific role in the models and their role does not involve direct interpretation. Therefore, the seminal table two fallacy paper by Westerreich and Greenland is in alignment with the following space-saving approach. Instead of having a series of table twos and avoiding the table two fallacy that way, you can meet the journal's word count and or table count requirements by having a single table two that reflects four different multivariable models, each based on different hypothesized realities or different diagrams where instead of listing the adjusted odds ratios or risk ratios or hazard ratios for the confounders in the model, you simply name them in the footnote in addition to how they were coded. So now we have a single table two 
that is reflecting results from four multivariable models. So in this case, you're interpreting four different numbers from a single table two, but these are four different numbers derived from four different adjusted models, all having been adjusted for different sets of confounding variables. And again, I've made up the confounders that were adjusted for where in the first model, multivariable model one is adjusted for confounder one, two, and three. The second model is adjusted for two, four, and five. The takeaway is just that different confounders will be adjusted for in different models, and that mutual adjustment is not a way you get around avoiding addressing confounding bias. So in conclusion, there is nothing stopping you from reporting several adjusted models within a single table two. So several adjusted odds ratios for each covariate of interest. And this is possible given that you're not supposed to interpret the adjusted odds ratios for the confounders anyways. So you can simply list them by name in the footnote of your table two. However, if you wanted to list the adjusted measure of effect for the confounders, you could still include all four complete multivariable models, including the adjusted odds ratios or risk ratios or hazard ratios for the confounders in an appendix or a supplementary material if you want it. And with that, thank you for watching all three videos in this Table 2 Fallacy series. I hope you learned a bit more about why this is an issue in epidemiology and how to avoid the Table 2 Fallacy in your work. Please click the subscribe button if you think you might want to return for videos in the future. Of course, leave any questions and comments below and check out related videos on this channel.